uh, I see a church. In other words, after our two years of, you know what, um, and it's time for us to refocus, to reboot, and to be reminded of what we believe uh, God is building here at New Life and continuing to build. So we want to remember, if you aim at nothing in life, you hit it. We want to be aiming at what the goals that God, I believe God wants us to build, the church that, I want, that, that God wants us to build here. So I've shared eight. Uh, I'm just going to recap them very quickly, and then we'll go on to the last two. Number one, I see a church that's full of faith, fire, and fun. Genuine faith. Jesus followers who are not prepared uh, to be fake, not prepared to live in hypocritical lives, but Jesus followers who are faithful and true and genuine Jesus followers. In other words, what God tells us to do, we do. What Jesus teaches us to do, we do. Um, Secondly, I see a church that is a generational church, uh, a church for the whole family. Um, So (laughs) when you're dealing with different generations, we obviously need patience and tolerance with each other, but we are better and we are stronger together. Thirdly, I see a church that uh, that enjoys fellowship with people of all color, kind, culture, building a kingdom culture in this church. Kingdom culture trumps all our other cultures. Uh, And kingdom culture determines that all lives matter. All lives matter to God, therefore must matter to us. Number four, I see a church that uh, is committed to social justice and helping to meet the needs of the poorer people in our community to the best of our ability with the resources and with the uh, generosity of its believers. Number five, I see a church that is committed to reaching the lost in our community and beyond. It's not an option for us to be evangelistic. It's not an option. It's a command from God. And in fact, Jesus said, go. Go into all the world, make disciples. And we need to get better at this. Um, By the grace of God, we will. Number seven, No, number six, I see a church that loves the Bible, learns the Bible, lives the Bible. We are a Bible-believing church. I see a church that encourages and equips all its partners in fellowship to do the work that God has called us believers to do. Um, The model that... For instance, on a cruise ship where the majority just lie around, lounge around, while the minority do all the work, there is no basis for that. There are no verses in the Bible to support that model. Every believer, I believe, is called to serve. We serve God by serving people. Um, And there again, I think we can improve on that. And number eight, I see a church, a generous church, where all its partners in fellowship give of their time, give of their talents, give of their treasure to help build the church of Jesus Christ. So we're going to do the last two. And number nine, I see a church that is an emotionally healthy church. People healed from their past hurts and the past storms of life. We have four purposes at New Life Church to reach, to restore, to enrich, and to release. The restoration of the human soul is big with God. It must be big with us as well. God God loves us and God accepts us just as we are because all of us, when we come to Jesus and we connect back to God, when we are reconciled to our Heavenly Father, we all come at a certain level or a certain degree of brokenness. Some more than others, depending on what your life history was. For example, if you, if you were adopted, I've learned in my, in my life that, you know what, if you were adopted, uh, adopted people, uh, they have to deal with issues like rejection or that. They have to deal with something that I'm, I'm not familiar with. I grew up in a, thank God, I grew up in a, in a home with a loving mother and a father. But they have to deal with issues and they have to get the victory over that. Um, so they're coming, when they come to Jesus, and I mean, you know, I believe Jesus wants to, to heal them, um, but, but they're dealing with issues. And, and 
if you've been through child abuse and things like that or grown up in abject poverty or that, you're dealing with stuff that a lot of people don't know, don't understand, but God does. So God accepts us as we are in all our hurt, in all our pain, with all our scars, with all our warts. God accepts us as we are, but God loves us too much to leave us as we are. From the moment we say yes to Jesus, we need to understand that, you know what? God is in the transformation business. It's got to be change. There's got to be a metamorphosis because the Holy Spirit comes to change us to be more like Jesus. So, I believe that God, God's divine design for all of us is that we live in a loving relationship with him, enjoying life, um, where, a life that you, where you've been restored and you've been made whole again uh, from all the storms and all the, the crises or traumas that you've been through in your life. We can't go on in life unless we get the freedom uh, from the past mistakes, past hurts, um, and, and, and past failures. The mission statement of Jesus, I believe, is found in Luke chapter 4, where he says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me to heal the brokenhearted. He's still doing it. He's still doing it today. And we are building a church here with people who choose not to be uh, governed by hurt, but to be governed by hope. Hope in the healing power of Dr. Jesus. He's done it for me. He can do it for you. He's done it for millions, billions. And um, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to do that finished work that Jesus died for us to have on the cross. Two years of living under this pandemic has wreaked havoc on the mental health of billions of people all over the world. Uh, Diane Langberg, who is a uh, practicing psychologist with a PhD got 50 years of clinical experience and she works uh, and, and 50 years of working with trauma survivors wrote this recently. She said trauma is perhaps the greatest mission field of the 21st century. I believe there's a lot of truth in that. 20 days ago on the 4th of July, our uh, health minister, Dr. Joe Pasha, revealed in parliament that more than 6 million people with common mental disorders, we're still waiting for treatment in South Africa. Over six million people in South Africa that are facing mental health challenges, and due to the resources, I mean the limiting and the diminishing, diminishing resources of our health department, how long is it going to take for that backlog to be worked, worked through? Joyce Meyer says that in, in our world, people often put on a plastic smile and tell everyone that they're doing fine while inside they're falling apart. Erica sent me this uh, a, couple, a couple of months ago, I think it was. Um, I'm fine, you know, it's fine, everything's fine. Well, I think if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us, we can be saying I'm fine, but inside we look like that. I want to show you a three-minute clip, a video. It's a podcast between uh, that Carrie Newoff had with John Eldridge. Now, these are two. John Eldridge wrote, wrote the book. He's wrote several books, um, Wild at Heart. But Carrie, Carrie Newoff, um, both of them actually, are, are come with very good... Uh, credentials or reputation in America, in North America, in the church. They are both leaders in the church there, and they both influence millions through their books, through their podcasts. And uh, they had a podcast recently, but just listen to what John Elridge says and see if you agree or not. Thanks, guys. John, it's so good to have you back. Welcome. Yeah, thanks, Kerry. It's good to see you again. Yeah, it's really good to see you, and I'm looking forward to catching up. So in addition to your work as a best-selling author and 
uh, the president of Wild at Heart Ministries, you've counseled thousands of people. And I'd love to know, <laughs> you know, everything we've been through, and I think we last talked a year or so ago. What are you learning about the human soul in this season? Yeah, people are very tapped out, very tapped out. And and there's a lot of reasons behind that, but um, we've just been through collectively two years of global trauma. And it's just kind to name it and go, look, folks, I mean, this is, you take people through high stress situations with no finish line in sight and you keep changing their normal and you take away the things they enjoy. It's traumatizing. Okay. And, and so we, in order to overcome even good things, the birth of a child, a wedding, you tap into your reserves. So we all tapped into our reserves in order to rally for the pandemic. And you think about leadership. I mean, come on. Because the leaders, they had to keep a, they had to keep a smile on their face and they had to keep a spree de corps and churches had to figure out how to do everything over again. Online and mass, no mass and the tensions and the, all that. So we're now in a state where we think the pandemic's behind us. We think it's all, you know, it's kind of in the rear view mirror. And people are trying to act like, hey, we're good now, right? We got restaurants back. You can travel you can go to concerts. We're good. And, and I'm going, wait, wait. <laughs> like, like, you don't understand the cascade effect of this kind of a thing. You get two years of that. It's going to have a long cascade in the human condition. And so what I'm seeing right now is pretty severe levels of depletion. Mm. And, and I, I thought I was crazy on this for a while, but I literally, today, I brought in three people, mature, um, people who live reasonably, they understand good soul practices, rhythm of life, that sort of thing. And I just wanted to ask them, how are you doing? What, what's your condition these days? Talk to me about your reserves. And every single one, all three of them are like, oh, I think I'm at about 40%. I, my functional right now. But the crazy, Carrie, is that the world is is acting like we're back and we're mm. fine. Yeah, you, you might not agree with that, but I think there's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom in that, and there's a lot of truth in that. So it's just about knowing where you are. If you if you agree with that, and say, you know what, I'm probably 40, 50, 60 percent. Um, When people ask us how we're doing, it's not, well, I'm fine. No, I think we need to be honest and say, well, we're getting there. We're getting there. But I think we need to understand that. Uh, a lot of people, you know, we, we, the theme for this year, I believe, that God gave us is moving from survival to revival. And it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's going to take time. And some people are going to find it, depending on how, how you went through and what happened to you, uh, through, uh, through the two years of COVID, uh, of lockdowns and that, um, it might take a little bit longer. But we're getting there. And as uh, I said this in the first service because I, I think we need to know this. You know, there was a saying that came out of COVID, um, it's okay not to be okay. Well, that's good. I agree with that partially. But if, I, if six months ago you asked me, uh, uh, you know, I'm okay not to be okay and I'm not okay, and you ask me in six months or in a year's time, and I'm still not okay, then, a, then I would get concerned. Because God never intended you for you to live in the desert. Never intended for your destination to be the desert permanently. God takes us through a desert to teach us lessons, and then we're on our way to a life, a new life. A life where we are above and not beneath. A life where we are uh, victors and not victims. God is for you. God, is, well, God wants to prosper you, spirit, soul, and body. God is setting you up to succeed in life, not to fail in life. So if, you, if, you, if, you were, if you're still camped in grief, you need to understand this. God's intention is not that you stay in grief. God wants to take you out and heal you and take you into a land where you enjoy life again. 
where you can be filled with his peace and filled with his joy. If you're still suffering from brokenness, allow Jesus, Dr. Jesus, to begin that healing process and that restoration process. So, there are many Bible characters who, who faced mental health challenges. So, by the way, uh, for those of you that weren't here last weekend or the weekend before, um, that week, two weekends ago when, when, when load shedding was um, on, off, on, off, on, off, it fried our projector. And... Um, just so that you're aware, we, we're claiming from insurance. It's ten and a half years old, by the way. Um, and unfortunately, the technology has moved on. It was a globe projector. They only make laser projectors now, so they don't have parts to fix it. So we're claiming from insurance, and hopefully in a few weeks' time, we can have a new one up and, up and running. But that's why we're just using the TV for now, just so that you're aware, okay? Just be patient. But wait, there's more. No, that's all. Uh, all right. There are many Bible characters. For instance, Jeremiah. Jeremiah in Lamentations chapter 3 loses all hope. He gets to a place where he's just lost hope. Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law. I mean, she, she lists all the, 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 the traumas of her life, and she says, God has, God has treated me badly, harshly. And, and then she says, just call me bitter. Elijah, I mean, he has one of the heavyweights of the Old Testament. Elijah, the great prophet of God, the major prophet. He gets this, a, a dark place in his life. He gets so depressed that he eventually says, God, just take me. I can't live anymore. I don't want to live anymore. He's a prophet of God. And then God takes him, puts him through a regiment as far as I'm concerned that I think a lot of modern day psychologists would probably uh, advise as well, give the same advice. He, God tells him to eat and he feeds him through the, ra the ravens. In other words, healthy diets help a lot when we're in a dark place uh, to get us out of that place. Healthy diet, God tells him, takes him on a, on a hike, on a long distance hike if you, if you, if you check on the map. A long walk. In other words, God gives him exercise. Thirdly, God tells him to sleep. He sleeps. Over the years of ministry, some 30 years now of ministry, being in the ministry, there have been some people in prayer lines that they shouldn't be in the prayer line. They should be at home sleeping. The most spiritual thing that I can do for them is go home and sleep. Your body was not designed to run 24-7 on fast forward. Week in, week out, month in, month out. It wasn't designed for that. Eventually you're going to burn and crash. So the, for some of you today, maybe this is the most spiritual advice I can give you. Go home and sleep. Not now, afterwards, okay? <laughs> Let me just finish my sermon here. Reminds me of Ian. Can you remember Ian? Years ago, he, was, he stood up and gave a testimony in the old church there. He said, I just want to give a testimony. He said, when you can't sleep, don't count sheep. He said, just remember what Zayn preached on Sunday. <laughs> and he said, I go over the points. And he said, well, I fall asleep straight away. But I'm thinking, what is that? A, 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 what was I make with this? Anyway, uh, moving on, moving on. So sleep, and then God... God gets him alone in a cave and whispers to him. And one whisper sets him free. One whisper gives him a breakthrough in his life. That's one, one whisper from God will give you a breakthrough in your life. One whisper. The Bible does not condemn people who suffer with mental health challenges. In the Bible, God offers you hope. God offers you solutions, not judgment. Three things very quickly that could possibly help you on your journey into healing and wholeness. Number one is hold on to the promises of God. 
There are some fantastic promises in the word of God. Psalms. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. God doesn't intend you to live in a place where there's just weeping and weeping and grief and weeping and weeping. Yes, for a season we go through that, but God wants joy to come into your life. A season of joy. That Psalm, that Psalm uh, 30, verse 5. And then in Peter, this is a fantastic verse from Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5. He says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by, uh, by means of Jesus Christ. So after you have suffered a while, he will restore you. He will support you. He will strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. What a promise. Psalm 119, great peace have those who love your law. Nothing causes them to stumble. Great peace. Hang on to the words of God, the, the promises from God. Secondly, pray. Pray. Use the, the ASK principle that Jesus taught. Ask. You know, Jesus said, he taught when you pray. Not if you pray, but when you pray, pray like this. And then on another occasion, he, 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 he mentioned this ask principle, A-S-K, ask, seek, knock. We keep doing that. Why? Because it's, prayer is faith. Prayer is a step of faith. And the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So we, we pray by faith. Ask God to give you a whisper. A whisper that will bring life into your, into your life, into your situation. Hope, faith, healing, comfort, prosperity. Pray. And then number three, I want to encourage you to join a life group. We are relaunching our uh, life groups in the first week of August. It's one of those things that, that suffered during, during lockdown. Obviously, we were told to isolate, to separate, can't meet. Uh, we, we, want to re, we want to rebuild our life groups now, and I believe it's very important. If there's two meetings that I ask, encourage every partner in Fellowship and New Life to be part of, and that's a Sunday morning service. One, please be in, this, in the house of God why? Because we, we, we do not fully understand the power of corporate praise and worship. We need it. We need it. And just to be like, for instance, this morning, just standing there, um, it's been the last 10 years in this, in this building, but previously in that building, Sunday mornings is it's, it's, it's vital for me. It's, it's a lifeline for me. I have to be here. There's something in corporate praise and worship. God just speaks to me. God blesses me. God strengthens me. God comforts me. God guides me. I need it. And I encourage you, when you come, we don't just sing songs. We enter into worship. We connect with our Heavenly Father. So I want to encourage you, every, every brother, sister in this family should be part of a Sunday morning service. And then secondly, to be part of a life group. Very important. We need each other. We need each other. In life groups, uh, we a place where we connect with God and we connect with people. So I want to encourage you, that starting the first week of August, uh, we're going to be doing a five-week course by uh, Max Ricardo called Anxious for Nothing, 20-minute video, and then we're going to look at some questions concerning that. But it's a study on Philippians chapter 4, um, and this, this course is going to teach us how we can live in the promise of God's supernatural peace. I believe we all need that. Uh, it's going to help. It's five lessons that are going to teach us. Uh, they're dedicated to helping us find freedom from anxiety. So rather than uh, overdosing on medication, we must be, we, we should be digging into God's word, and that's what we want to do in our midweek meetings. All right, number 10, the last one, I see a church uh, where vibrant life groups come together uh, or they comprise the heart of the body. Life groups that function as the church should, not just social meetings um, to pass the time, but committed Christians getting together 
to work out their common salvation in the real world. Now, I'm sure many of us are thinking, wow, my life is too busy to fit another meeting in already. Please. Um, so I want to I encourage you and challenge you to just to reprioritize uh, life. As far as I know, as far as I can determine, there's one place in the New, in the New Testament where God calls somebody a fool. There are, there are, I think there are a few times in the Old Testament, for instance in Proverbs, where the proverb says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But in the New Testament, I can only find the one where God calls somebody a fool. And it's an occasion where Jesus taught a parable on the rich fool. Luke chapter 12 it's about a man that was making a lot of money. Just busy, busy, busy making money. And he wants to make more money. So he said this. He said, I will do this. He said, I will pull down my bonds and I will build bigger ones. And there I will store up my, pro- my crops and my goods. I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for yourself for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink. And be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this night your soul will be required from you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? And then Jesus ends with these words He says, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Folks, if we're too busy for God, we're too busy. We're too busy. You need people and people need you. We need each other. We need to allow God to use us to encourage other people, to bless other people, to strengthen other people. And that happens best in life groups. So the life group course starts the first week of August, ends in September, anxious for nothing. I want to encourage you to please sign up at the information desk uh, if you want to be part of a life group. Maybe you want to host one in your home. Talk to us. Um, So sign up at the information desk or speak to Lauren. Lauren, just stand up so everybody can see you. You see, that's Lauren. Wave at them. That's right. Wave. That's good. That's Lauren. Uh, if you want to know anything about she's the life group coordinator, so she knows uh, a lot about the life group. So please just speak to her if you need more information. So let me wrap up here. We're building a church with believers who are on a journey towards emotional and mental health and wholeness because Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted and set captives free. We're building a church with vibrant, healthy life groups. Life groups that connect people to God and people to people. Let me close with a verse that I've used in the previous two uh, parts of the series. It's from Numbers chapter 10. It's, it's on the, during the Exodus, Moses is, is leading the people out to the promised land. And uh, on the journey, some of his family meet up with him family that weren't living in uh, Egypt but they meet up with him and he says to them he says we are setting out for the place which the Lord God said I will give to you come with us we will treat you well for the Lord has promised good things to us if you haven't made New Life Church your spiritual home in Mossel Bay yet I want to strongly encourage you to do that we all need a spiritual home Uh, God is big on the local church. It's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. And so I want to encourage you, come with us. God has promised good things to this church. Amen. Can I ask you to stand, please? Let's just pray, and then we're going to close with a song. Lord Jesus, what a privilege it is to to be helping, to be serving you and to be helping build your church. 
something that's going to last for eternity, forever and ever and ever. What a privilege it is. We ask that you would help us, Father, to do it even in a greater measure, Lord. Help us, help us to build a church here, Father God, that will impact and influence this beautiful community where you've placed us. That will change lives for the better, Father God. Help us to grow, Lord. Help us to live lives that are free from hurt and from pain, from the bruises of the past. Help us to live lives, Father God, filled with your peace, filled with your joy. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you came to give life and to give it more abundantly, Lord. And thank you, that is our portion in you. By faith, we receive it this morning in Jesus' holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Please.